morning and welcome to the seventh meeting of 2018 of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. Before we move to the first item on the agenda, I want to remind everyone present to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices as these may affect the broadcasting system. The first item on the agenda is for the committee to consider whether to take items three and four in private. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Um, the second item on the agenda is to take evidence on the reasoning for a breach in parliamentary procedure on the Electricity Works Environmental Impact Assessment Scotland Amendment Regulations 2017 SSI 2017-451. I want to welcome Paul Hewhouse, Minister for Business and Innovation and Energy, Joanna Dingwall, the Solicitor for Rural Affairs Scottish Government, and Gail Holland, Compliance Manager for Marine Scotland. Uh, Minister, can I begin by offering you the opportunity to speak um, to this issue? Thank you very much, Convener, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for the opportunity to, to speak today. At the end of 2017, I became aware of an inconsistency between the Electricity Works Environmental Impact Assessment Scotland Regulations 2017 and the EIA Directive. Uh, this inconsistency required applications for a Section 36 uh, variation with no additional significant uh, environmental impact to undertake a full EIA assessment going well beyond the requirements of the EIA Directive. The amendments I laid at the end of last year to the 2017 regulations apply only to those applications for variations with no additional significant environmental impact or effects. Uh, for example, a change in turbine capacity in terms of the number of megawatts it can generate uh, only. All other uh, variations are required to undertake an EIA process, and it's important we stress that. Um, the amendment is not for developers to bypass the EIA uh, process. It was necessary to urgently amend the 2017 regulations to bring them in line with the EIA directive and minimise the unnecessary regulatory burden on uh, ministers, stakeholders and developers. And these amendments will help ensure that further delays to offshore wind farm developments are avoided without compromising our commitment to safeguarding the environment. Um, where there are potential environmental impacts resulting from offshore wind farms, there are several, several measures in, in place to ensure environmental protection. These include a full EIA process, wide-ranging consultation and stringent planning conditions. For example, uh, approximately 50 consultation bodies uh, are consulted with the consultation ranging from 30 days to four months. Um, representations are also invited from members of the public. While the breach of the 28-day uh, rule, which uh, gives time for the committee to consider the instrument, was not ideal, and I, I regret having to do it in this situation, I felt it was considered necessary to bring the 2017 EIA regulations in line with the EIA directive as soon as I was aware of the inconsistency in the legislation. Now that we have identified this anomaly uh, between the 2017 regulations and the EIA directive, and as part of our drive for continual improvements for efficiency and robustness, we'll undertake a, a review of the 2017 regulations and the Marine Works EIA Scotland regulations 2017 to ensure they are consistent with each other as they are also both applied to the same sector. Uh, I'm happy to take questions, Convener. Uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, Member uh, Stuart Stevenson. Um, just a technical and con context uh, question. Um, ministers uh, under Section 36 have no legislative competence under th Section 36, uh, just administrative ability. Um, to give consents for generation over 50 megabytes, it, but, megawatts, computer strikes again. Um, so I, I, t I take it, therefore, the only way in which this sort of thing can be uh, sorted out where there's a conflict is not by looking at the Electricity Act, but by looking at the bringing the regulations together in one interpretation. I believe that's the case, but I'll, I'll check with my colleague Joanna Dingwall just in case there's any misunderstanding there. But I believe that is the case, Mr Stevenson, and uh, yeah, you're correct in that assumption. Clarify something, Minister, that you said. I hope I've picked you up correctly here. You said the only circumstances in which an EIA wouldn't be required would be generating capacity. May, com may have misrepresented that, Convener, so I'm glad you picked that up. Uh, what we're saying is that if the change in the technology deployed on, on the site was such that there was no environmental impact, the best example being if a turbine was upgraded in terms of its uh, power output, uh, that, uh, in, in, unless uh, improved otherwise, it wouldn't have any uh, environmental impact. And we'd obviously put this out to consultation to key stakeholders, so if there was perceived to be a a concern about the impact of changing a turbine to make it more powerful, that there was an unanticipated impact on the environment, there will be an opportunity for stakeholders to raise that. And then obviously, 
if that was felt to be significant, then an EIA uh, process could be triggered. Um, but there are other potential uh, technological changes that may be minor, that may have no impact on the environment at all, uh, and therefore, similarly, they would be put out to consultation and obviously stakeholders felt they had an impact that could be raised. More significant changes such as increase in, in a, uh, the swept area of a, of a turbine, the length of the blades, the height of the towers clearly could have a potential impact on uh, birds and other species and environmental impact changes to foundations or, or moorings uh, could also similarly have an impact. So, those kind of uh, changes are more likely to, to require an EIA um, because of their significance. Uh, obviously depending on the scale of, of change that was involved, uh, but uh, certainly a, a change in turbines power, power output we do not believe would have an environmental impact, so that's an example I cited, but I didn't mean to present it as being the only, uh, the only example if that's, uh, that's something. To point, I'm really getting that because my understanding is normally a significant change in the power capacity of a turbine is linked to an increase in the size in the turbine. So in reality, the chances are that most circumstances would be covered by an EIA. Uh, certainly in terms of the, the, the blades or the, uh, the change in the nacelle, um, which is the, the sort of uh, cockpit, if you like, of the turbine or something of that nature, the height of the, the tower could potentially change its environmental impact. We, we accept that and I think developers uh, would, would tend to accept that as well. Um, this is purely the, the guts of the turbine, if you like, the actual engine of the turbine that's uh, perhaps able to uh, generate its uh, Higher, higher power output um, from, from uh, the same amount of wind. Uh, therefore, you're increasing the, the power uh, capacity of the site. Now, that can arise for a number of reasons, uh, potentially, obviously, because we have uh, changes in terms of the financial environment for wind farms, both onshore and offshore, that is necessary with either reduced subsidy or more competitive environment for subsidy, that they need more powerful turbines to be able to be competitive in terms of winning that. But it may also be the case that turbine manufacturers have moved on their technology and no longer making them less efficient. Uh, turbine units and therefore they have to use the, the available technology that is there for them and have to replace like with like um, but with more a, a more powerful uh, outcome uh, from the point of view of generation capacity uh, and that doesn't have a, in our view uh, or at least uh, to date we've not seen evidence that has an environmental impact and is likely to be something that wouldn't require an EIA under the change that we've made. Okay thanks. I've got a number of members want to come in. Mark Roscoe to be followed by Claudia Beamish to yeah, be followed thanks, by Stuart Steen. Um, Perhaps just further to that, Minister, could you say a little bit more about the screening process? Um, because, uh, you know, there is a determination of what is a significant environmental impact or not, which then triggers an EIA. So what, what, what actually happens before something is ruled out of a full EIA process? Well, obviously, it would depend on whether we had an application for a variation. So it assumes that a developer comes in make, wishing to make such a variation and then presents a scenario whereby uh, they want to uh, change perhaps the, the turbine to more powerful output. That would then be uh, notified to stakeholders um, who would then have, uh, I'll just uh, check with colleagues just the length of time. 28 days. Yes. Um, uh, 28 days. 28 days uh, convener uh, to, to respond to that, to indicate whether they felt there was a, a material change that did have an environmental impact. And uh, unless there was such a representation made, maybe, as I say, there's maybe 50 bodies potentially that would be notified of that and therefore have the ability to, to respond to, to that. Uh, and if they didn't respond or, or responded they were happy or content with the change, then, then present, uh, it could go forward without uh, an EIA being triggered. Um, but I'll just check with colleagues, uh, Gail uh, Holland, uh, convener, if I may bring in Gail Holland. Thank you. Um, so where, where it's thought that there may be an environmental impact from um, one of these changes proposed, it would go through a formal screening process at that stage under the EIA regulations. And at that time, um, we would consult with a number of consultation bodies to get views from them on whether they thought the change proposed would, go, would cause environmental impacts. Um, and on the basis of that consultation, we would um, form a screening opinion, which would either screen it into the EIA process if there were significant effects identified, or out of the EIA process if there were no significant effects identified. Okay. Uh, just about data. Um, obviously, data is very important in terms of you know understanding impact on uh, potential species, but also, you know, in, in informing the industry and, and informing uh, the wider sectors as well. Um, so I'm just wondering, does this have any bearing, this change on data collection and the requirements for data collection? 
Uh, to my to my interpretation, no. I mean, if if there is an environmental impact identified, for example, then we would clearly want monitoring uh, of uh, any impact of a project on uh, species that would not not, not change uh, just based on the turbine having changed. For example, it would still be a requirement for the project. Um, it may well be that projects which are applying for a change in turbine have had an identified environmental impact. It's deemed to be obviously through the consented process be one. Um, that, that can be either managed or, or is acceptable, uh, but that doesn't mean it's, they stop the requirement for, for monitoring simply because they've um, you know, not had to go through an EIA for the change in the turbine. So um, I want to reassure the member that if uh, environmental impacts are identified, then they will still need to be uh, dealt with in the same way uh, as previously in terms of uh, monitoring requirements and mitigation when it's required or there's planning conditions that would still need to be um, fulfilled. Okay. Claudia Beamish. Convener, morning, Minister and uh, colleagues. Uh, it's a follow-up question to that. Uh, is there any guidance which is publicly available in terms of any list of what is unlikely uh, to be um, necessary to um, go through the environmental impact, impact assessment process? Because I just think this might, in some ways, reassure stakeholders and, and um, anyone with an interest. I, I I don't believe there's a published guidance yet, but I've maybe asked Gail if she can respond to that, Convener. Um, no, there is Scottish Government guidance in place, um, but it needs to be updated to incorporate um, the amendments to these regulations. So the guidance that's in place was published in 2015, and it makes very clear that any application for a variation is only kind of appropriate if the proposals are not fundamentally different in terms of scale, character and environmental effects. So that's the kind of wider guidance, but it does require to be updated to include the changes brought about by these amendments, and that will be done in um, due course. Yeah. So nothing specifically yet, Convener, from, from this, but certainly need to be updated. In response to Corey Beamish's valid point, that when that is updated, you write to the committee minister detailing the exact yes. position that we will then very, be in. Very happy to give that commitment, Convener. I think that's an entirely sensible uh, suggestion. OK. Do any other members have uh, further questions? Do you have anything you wish to add, Minister? Uh, no, just to, to stress that, uh, other than that, to stress that this is done in exceptional circumstances, I very much respect the 28 day rule and the reason for it being there. Um, it's done reluctantly in this case, and hence my desire to offer immediately to, to appear before the committee because uh, I was aware of the, the great um, importance of trying to maintain such disciplines. Uh, so, reassure the committee it's not uh, going to be a general rule, uh, it's very much the exception to the rule. Okay, Minister, thank you for your time and that of your colleagues today. Um, at its next meeting on the 6th of March, the committee will consider the Carbon Accounting Scheme, uh, Scotland Amendment Regulations 2018 SSI 2018 40, and its work programme. The committee will also consider draft correspondence to the Equalities and Human Rights Committee and its approach to an inquiry on the marine environment. As agreed earlier, we will now move into private session and I ask that the public gallery be cleared as the public part of the meeting is now over.